and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our weekly deep dive. For those of you that might be new to these events, we are hosted on Cloud Customer Connect, which is our Oracle community forum for end users. I'll be sharing some links and resources that today that will lead you back to those forums. And if you're not already a member, we invite you to create a free account and post questions and join in discussions on all kinds of topics. My name is Kenna Ketrick. I'm a program manager with the OCI go-to-market team. And today I'm joined by Mike Bray, director of Oracle NoSQL development, and Tim Go, NoSQL principal product manager, for a dive into Oracle's flexible NoSQL database. All right, I think that is quite enough for me. So Mike, go ahead and take it away. It's all yours. Great, thank you. So as Kenna mentioned, um, Tim and I will be presenting. I'll do most of the slides. Tim will do a demo toward the end of the presentation. And we're gonna cover today why we feel the Oracle NoSQL database is indeed the world's most flexible NoSQL database. So let's get rolling here. So to start with, it's always good to have a little bit of a architecture diagram. This architecture works basically equally well for our cloud service as well as our on-premise product. We'll start with the description starting from the bottom here, basically from the ground up. So a NoSQL cluster, NoSQL plot, pod, we use various terms to describe it basically starts with a bunch of hardware. That hardware is basically layered across different uh, fault containment zones that helps to drive our high availability uh, for the product. We like to use commodity hardware, stuff that you can basically get off the shelf. We are work equally well if you use sort of, you know, large machines that are divided up into VMs or whether or not you have sort of smaller bare metal machines really doesn't make a bit of difference to the cloud service as a whole or to the on-premise product. What we call the sort of physical devices is we call them storage nodes. Moving up to the next layer, you see the square rectangular boxes those represents our shards. Um, in the cloud service, we have 16 shards. If you are going with a on-premise setup, you can control the number of shards um, that you have in your cluster. Shards are basically made up of what we call replication nodes. Those are the circles that are annotated under each of the shards in the diagram. We have two kinds of replication nodes. We have elected leaders and we have replicas. We highly recommend to all of our customers that they use at least three replication nodes per shard. That's what we use in our cloud service. For our on-premise customers, most of them use three. Um, we have some though that use as high as five replication nodes. The way that the replication nodes work is when writes come into the system, the writes are directed to the elected leader. When reads come in, it will be directed to the currently fastest available replication node. So the reads could go to the elected leader or the reads could go to any of the replicas. Because we have at least three of them out there, right? this gives us a high degree of parallel activity when it comes to the read operation. As I mentioned with the rights, they originally go to the elected leader. Once the rights are done and committed, then that changed data will get replicated um, over to each of the replicas. If we focus our attention over to the middle box, we'll see that the replicated leader, its actual physical hardware is in zone one. The next replica, its hardware is in zone two. And the final replica, its hardware is in zone three. Again, that helps to enforce our high availability. We do that on purpose. We set up the topology this way and all of our software is what we consider to be topology aware. So we could lose a given sort of fault containment zone, but we aren't gonna lose the functionality of that shard. It'll be handicapped for a brief period of time until the hardware issues can get addressed and get back up and running, but the shard will continue to run. It can continue to take requests and service requests. 
if one of the elected leaders goes down, um, then we will elect a new leader out of the remaining replication nodes that are there. So in this particular case, right, one of the two remaining replicas, one of those will become the elected leader. Um, once the elected leader comes back up and running, the original one, it will come up as a replica and it will just kind of continue processing from there. Moving up one more step in the hierarchy, we have the hash function. Um, every one of our records has a shard key. The shard key goes through the hash function. The purpose of the hash function is to determine what shard that particular record lives in. So up above that, we have our key space. The key space represents all of the records that are stored in the NoSQL store. Again, all of them have a shard key. And in some cases, the shard key and the primary key are identical. They don't have to be. Um, the shard key can be a subset of the primary key. Moving a little bit further up the stack, we have the NoSQL driver. We have various language drivers. Um, those drivers are compiled into the application, and then you have your application uh, that is up and running. And uh, from the hardware standpoint, like I mentioned before, you know, we basically want commodity hardware. So nothing, you know, special to run on, you know, off the shelf commodity stuff. Focusing in a little bit on the cloud service itself, um, it's a fully managed serverless cloud service. And what we offer is essentially what we call a table. What you do in the cloud service is you create a table, you manage the table, you add records, you remove records, you update records from a table. So unlike some of the other cloud services that Oracle has to offer, you're not creating a database. Um, we already have the database up and running behind the scenes in the cloud service for you. Uh, we have that on um, the high end of the hardware that's offered through OCI. Um, so that's already built. What you're basically allocating is a uh, independent table out of the database that already exists. Um, we offer single digit millisecond latencies that are predictable at all of the scales that we operate at. Typically, we see the reads at two to four milliseconds. Um, writes typically come in at six to eight milliseconds. We regularly do testing on our cloud service. We know that it scales. Um, we do high-end testing for every release that uh, we put out there. Um, we support several different data models, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail in a future slide. As the architecture diagram showed, you know, we are built for high availability in our cloud service. Um, we have everything is, is duplicated, some cases replicated. Um, so we have high availability built into the cloud service. Um, we have full asset compliance. We can do serverless computing through Oracle functions. And at the time of putting this slide together, um, we're now live in 30 different OCI commercial regions uh, worldwide. We typically see three different use cases for Oracle NoSQL. And this is across our uh, current set of customers. So we can tend to put them in uh, three different buckets. Um, we have the first bucket where um, the workload is highly variable. Um, it has peaks and valleys, and uh, we can move seamlessly uh, through those. We have another set of customers where they want um, high consistent uh, throughput. They're looking for predictable uh, low latencies. Um, we see this very common in some of our uh, banking customers um, and uh, some of our other uh, Intel customers. So uh, they, they, they need the high value, but really they're relying on the fact that the service can provide a predictable low latency. Then we have a whole group of customers that really are looking at uh, large scale operations. So we serve a, a wide variety of different customers with different use cases. At the end of the day, we basically have three kind of different metrics or, or three different units that have to be provisioned for our cloud service. So we have throughput provisioning, and then we also have storage provisioning. This particular slide 
focuses in on the throughput provisioning, where we have what we call a read unit and a write unit. A read unit or a write unit is basically a read or a write of one kilobyte of data. And the way that Oracle does this is it, it basically is a read or a write per second for the number of seconds in a month. Now, thankfully for us, Oracle has said there's 744 hours in each month. Now, whether or not there actually is, doesn't matter. From a, a processing standpoint, there's always 744 hours in a month. And so if you go hmm, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, that gets you 3,600 times 744 hours. That basically gets you approximately 2.67 million reads or writes um, of a given read unit or write unit. So at the end of the day, when you look at a, from a provisioning standpoint, you really should think about it in terms of, well, how many reads or writes do I need to do concurrently per second? Is it 10, is it 100, is it 1,000, right? In which case you would do, you know, 10 read units, 100 read units, or you would do 1,000 uh, read units, for example. We just rolled out actually about two weeks ago, another type of uh, provisioned capacity um, that we call on demand. So we have a provision capacity. And the way that works is you have to determine your reads and writes in advance. You can adjust those via a API or through the OCI console. You can increase them whenever you need to eat, increase them. You can decrease them up to four times a day. And, and under the pure provision model, you basically pay for what you provision. So if, if you don't use everything, you're still paying for what you provision. Now, in order to use the provision model, you really have to have a deep understanding of the workload and you need to know what your workload is doing. So we had a bunch of customers and they basically said, you know, it's, it's like, it's really hard for us to figure out, you know, exactly what our workload's going to do in advance. So we developed the on-demand capacity pricing model. And within that model, basically the service will auto scale for you on your behalf. All you have to do is designate a table as a on-demand table, and then we will take care of the scaling for you. You don't have to do any workload characterization. You don't have to you know, try to limit uh, what your application is doing. It's very, very easy to use. And under this particular model, you pay for what you consume. So we have sort of these two different models, you know, a pay by what you provision and a pay by what you consume. Let's take a look at the provision model in a little bit more detail. Um, here we have a example, let's see, that's uh, Java. We have an example of Java. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, right? You can either set this up through the console, the OCI console, or through one of our um, application SDKs. So this is an example out of Java. Uh, here we have a table request. Within that, we have a set statement that's defining our table. This is creating a table called foo, which has two columns in it, an ID and a value column. Then we have the set table limits clause, which is setting the limits. And in this particular example, we're setting it up for 2,000 read units, 100 write units, and 500 gigabytes of storage. And then if, you know, later on, a month or two later, you go, hey, I want to lower my limits, you use the exact same API, the table request call, you do the set limits. Notice in the, in the update, we no longer have the set statement clause because the table's already created. And here, what we're doing is we are lowering the read limits from 2,000 down to 8,000. Um, because the table request call is a DDL statement, uh, we have to um, rate limit the DDL statements. And so you can do up to four DDL statements a minute. Um, some people look at that as shock, but you know, really when you think about it, how often are you really changing the DDL of your table, right? For most of us, that's a very, very infrequent uh, occurrence, right? So the fact that we rate limit it, um, you know, we haven't had any of our customers that have really stumbled onto that. All right, so let's take a look at a sort of corresponding view of this 
through the on-domain case. Uh, this is, let's see, uh, this is Python code. Um, so here's an example using Python. Um, same kind of idea. You submit a table request. Um, your statement up above, that defines your table. Again, this is a, a two-column table with an ID and a name column. In the table request, we have a, a table limits clause. If you notice, it starts out with a zero, zero, one. The first two zeros, we set the read limits to zero. We set the write limits to zero. The one in this case is the storage. So we're allocating one gigabyte. And then notice in the big bold capital letters, we say capacity mode on demand, right? So we are easily identifying this particular table as a on demand table. On um, the final statement, do table request, that is doing the actual execution of the statement. And uh, 50,000 and 3,000 there, that is some uh, timeout information, how long we're willing to wait for a response back on, on this request to be executed. Um, so super easy to do. Um, you set your reads, reads and writes to zero, and then you supply the on-demand um, constant, and then you will get a on-demand table. Let's take a look at how the on-demand operates. So we have a workload. Uh, this workload is going to vary um, from day to day to day. So hopefully what we will see is that our uh, throughput will then vary correspondingly to the workload. So why does our workload vary? Well, we have you know, different numbers of queries that are coming in on a given day and we have different numbers of, of new records that, that are coming in. And you know, each of these sort of change from day to day to day. Right, and with on demand, the throughput capacities will change automatically for you. There's no throttling. There isn't anything that you will have to do. And you know, since the queries and the new data are changing, right, that's going to map into our actual units, which is read units and write units. And as you can see up on the screen, the read units and the write units indeed vary over day to day to day. And of course, what we're probably most interested in is what it's just going to do from a cost point of view. And then, you know, from an operational standpoint, right, because you are charged for what you consume, right, the day-to-day -day option uh, operational costs vary as well. Now, let's say you wanted to come along and change your storage and you know see how much storage you need to allocate again you would go back and issue that through the api call or you could also do that through the console one of the great things about our service is all of our drivers go through what we call a proxy um, we use the exact same proxy for our cloud service that we um, recommend our customers to use for the on-premise product this provides a huge advantage. The advantage is this, that any given application that you write, it will work equally well against the cloud service or on-premise. All you have to do is basically change your connect string to tell the application which particular one you wanna to connect to. Because obviously, you know, the connect path for the cloud service is gonna be different than the connect path for your on-premise database. So we do have customers that, you know, do this, in all actuality, for business reasons, they like to have some of their data on premise. And for business reasons, they're happy to have some of their data in the cloud. So through a single application, they can operate on both sets of data. A little bit about our pricing or licensing. Uh, we have a community edition, which is free. We have an enterprise edition, which is under a pay per processor model. Um, that's the typical Oracle uh, pricing model. And then, as I've already mentioned, we have the fully managed. Um, uh, here's the cost per read unit and write unit. Um, the storage, whether or not you're using provisioned or on demand, um, the storage per uh, gigabyte is identical. We also have this thing called a hosted environment. This is for customers that have extremely um, high usage for reads and writes. Um, and what we do is we can create a, a dedicated backend for the server um, for this particular customer. 
we will give them a private endpoint. Um, this is something that is sort of totally set up separately, and it's something that you'd have to go through Oracle Sales to get set up. Looking at this from a product and service point of view, um, our community and enterprise edition, um, they can be run on premise. They can be run in any of the cloud vendors that are out there, whether it's AWS, Azure, the Oracle Cloud. Uh, we have a lot of customers that are, are running on uh, Azure and AWS. Um, it can be run in a hybrid cloud environment. Of course, there's the fully managed service. And we also have this thing called KV Local. Um, that is for edge computing. That's basically a single process version of NoSQL. It's, it's extremely scaled down. Um, it'll, it works with the same APIs that um, the larger versions of it do, but the intent is to be running and for that to be used in uh, edge computing cases. I had mentioned data models early on. Uh, with data models, we have a key value, we have a schema list, and we have a fixed schema. We have examples across the bottom of the slide there showing each one of those. Oftentimes, you will hear schema list referred to as a document store um, or storing document records. You know, and usually when you know folks use that terminology, they're, they're really referring to some type of JSON object. So if you see kind of the highlight of the example above, we show a expansion of this field that we call value, which is really nothing more than a, a JSON object. Uh, fixed schema, fixed schema is what we would more traditionally see in a pure relational database where each row has a set of columns. Each of those columns has a, a well-defined uh, data type. And you know, if you try to put the wrong type of data in that particular column, you'll get an error. But you know, we work equally well across each of these different kinds of data models. And in fact, we are seamless when we operate across them. Here's a example of a schema list and a fixed schema model. We show you the definition. And here we wanna answer the question in both of those models. Hey, I want to know all the visitors that came to my site in November who are males between the age of 24 and 30. And if you notice, the, the SQL syntax for each of those, regardless of the model, is 100% identical, right? So we take care of all the work behind the scenes and figuring out, oh, this is a schemaless model or this is a fixed schema model. You know, we operate seamlessly. And, and we take that worry off your hands. Uh, here's a list of the different regions that we're currently in. I had mentioned that we're currently in 30. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a list of all of our SDKs. We have SDKs for all of the uh, top languages that are out there, Java, Python, Node, Go, uh, c -sharp .net, and Spring. Um, we also have other interfaces. Uh, Terraform is a scripting interface. Um, the OCI um, command line interface, another interface that you can use um, through the console. So we have a wide variety of ways that you can come and uh, access your data. We have each of our APIs has a basic set of CRUD APIs. So you can query your data, you can do gets, puts, uh, scans with uh, our CRUD APIs. If you want a sort of richer view of things, um, you can access via our SQL. And my next set of slides are gonna be covering um, some of the uh, SQL syntax and some of the specifics around that to give you a better idea of the richness that we offer there. Uh, we have time to live functionality, which is really nothing more than a auto aging out of data. Um, probably 30% of our customers uh, use the auto aging of data. Um, you basically insert the data, you set a time to live value at the table level. Then at the row level, you know, if you want to override your default, you can do that because let's say you have a particular row of data that, you know, you just want to 
have it hang out a little bit longer. You can do that. Um, and so the auto aging is basically a way that we will behind the scenes remove data from the database on your behalf. And here, just a quick description. You know, a table is a you know unordered collection of record items. All right, let's jump over to some details of our SQL language. So this slide, um, it's all color coded. So hopefully that'll make things a little bit easier to see. Um, toward the bottom, we give you examples of what we're doing. It's color coded. So then up in the SQL syntax, we use a corresponding color so you can see what we're doing there. We offer uh, predicates, uh, projections, paging, uh, group by and aggregates. Under predicates, we have simple scalars. And if you want to display um, a simple JSON fragment, so only a small piece of a JSON document, uh, we have the capability to do that. We have a wide variety of string functions. Uh, we have paging. Uh, we have the ability to do sorted results, the you know traditional order by and SQL syntax. With for paging, we have limit and offset. Uh, limit is how many records you want per row, and then offset is okay. How deep into my list do I want to start displaying? Right. So I'm going to start here in this example on the 26th record, and then I'm going to group them in groups of 25 until I've displayed all of my records selected. Uh, we have the traditional group by um, within SQL. Uh, we have time functions, a uh, rich variety of time functions. You know, you can pull out years, days, month, hours, minutes. You know, we have adding, we have subtracting, we have deltas, we have duration. We have quite a bit in the area of uh, time functions. Um, and then we offer simple aggregates, uh, min, max, average, sum, and count. The upsert, document upsert command allows you to, while you're inserting a record, to do quite a bit of sort of updating and manipulation to that record. You can add new arrays to remove array elements. You could put new arrays into an existing document. Um, extremely powerful uh, SQL statement because of the different things that you can do. We also offer shard local joins. We do that through our nested table statement. Within our nested table statements, we have the concept of ancestor and descendants. We can go in infinite direction in either upward in the ancestor direction or downward in the descendant direction. Um, the syntax of the nested table statement, it basically offers you a left outer join semantic. Now, we also have uh, regex expressions. We have uh, GeoJSON objects natively stored in the database. We have points, lines, and polygons. We have bounded box. We can do intersections. We have a series of functions, such as within distance, uh, nearby, that are sort of built into the system. For those of you that want a automatic ID generated, uh, we offer ID generation. With that, we have a starts with uh, increment a max value. Um, pretty standard in terms of syntax for ID generation. Um, the caching function basically says, hey, I'm going to execute my ID generator once. And in this case, I'm going to basically produce a thousand values, which I'm going to cache. So when you need your next ID, it's already pre created, sitting in the cache. And when you insert your next record, you know, we will just grab the next ID for you. We have a complex uh, secondary indexing. We have indexing on scalars, non-scalars. We have uh, multi-column or composite indexes. And you can also do indexing into um, any field within a JSON. So in the example here, we basically put a index on zip code, right? Which is sort of deeply embedded in this particular JSON document. And within that field within there, you can actually index into it. And on top of that, we have indexing into arrays. 
Um, this is a fairly complex structure where we have a lot of nested arrays going on. And we want to do a index on the action airport, which is a field within the actions array. So deep within this nested structure, you can create a index. And then we're showing you a sample query on how to set a value for that index so you can pull out a particular record using that index. All right, next what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna turn this over to Tim and then he will fire up a live demo for all of you. So thank you, Mike. Uh, in the previous slide, Mike spoke about the on-demand versus provision capacity tables. In the next 10 to 15 minutes or so, I will demo how the two table types respond to different workloads. And I'll mainly focus on the right workload in this demo, just to simplify things. Read workload will work the same way. My program will run a variety of small write workloads, simulating some workload scale up and scale down at different time interval to see how the on-demand versus provision table respond to the workload. Now let's go through some OCI setup that I have to, for the demo. So right here, this is the NoSQL Cloud Service at the Ashburn region. And I have two OCI instances. And each of those instance has the NoSQL Python SDK. And on the left, and the workload will be driven like the number of KV right per second. In my case, each record is one KV. So make things really simple. If you write 10 records, it's 10 KV per second. So the number of right unit you need will be 10. So now on the left-hand side will be the on-demand table. The right-hand side will be provision table. Both are going to get this type of workload. Work, there will be a, a small size workload, W1, a medium size, W2, and <clears throat> will be the largest uh, workload here. Still, I'm doing a very small workload just to demo the, the uh, just to do the demo, and it's much easier to see the result. <laughs> so let me go through the, each of the workload here. So the workload number one, which is smallest one, will be 4 KB per second. I'll be using four threads, as I shown in the previous slide. Each instance uh, within that will be my Python program, which will run four threads. Uh, each of the thread for the duration of five minutes is going to uh, pump one KB, which is one record per second, writing one record. So there's a total of, if you think of one minute, the dashboard is showing a sum of all the record going through, or all the KBs consumed per minute. So it's much easier to view it that way um, by showing this column here. Within one minute, you're gonna see 240 KB for the first workload, which is right here, right? The next workload, medium size, I call it. And I, I'm gonna sleep for five minutes. So there's a gap here, you'll see a sleep here. And the medium size workload will be eight KB. The largest size will be 16 KB, which each of the thread is doing four KB Writes, which is the four record writes, and you're going to get 960 right per minute total. And the last workload, which is a scale down, uh, is going to be the same as workload number two. So now this is what you're going to see in the real demo. There will be a um, a, a uh, two programs here pumping the workload. And each of them is going to, uh, to run this different, in, for different in time interval, is going to pump different size of uh, right operations. So let me show some code here. Now, this is the code, a Python code for the OT. OT is the on-demand table. At the very beginning, I import some stuff from Python, and this Borneo is the SDK for the, our Python. Now the next, you get to decide which 
Is it cloud service that you want to connect to? Is it cloud simulator, which is a local a, a copy of sort of not for production for you to play with? We call it cloud sim. Or this is the on-premise endpoint you want to connect to. So as Mike uh, mentioned in the previous slide, through a proxy. Remember that it can go through the proxy. So it can go anywhere that you want within our product. Now the table I use for the uh, example here is Team Demo 1 and compartment is matrix, which is my favorite, uh, which is my own. So here is the code. This is for simulator only. And this part of the code is getting the handle. So you get a NoSQL handle back. And if a cloud, then it's going to look at, hey, the credential stuff. Are you providing the credential or you're using a config file? In my case, I'm using a config file. It's much easier. I don't show my stuff, my OCI ID here. So to me, it's much e better to, to show demo. So it depends on the, what I type in, it's going to go to a different endpoint, call it that way. Now here is the um, a function for the, uh, the thread that I have. So I have all this different time that I, I think in my slide, I have, for example, if I pass in one, one, it will be writing at one KB per second. If I pipe, it, pipe in point 0.5, it will be 2 KB per second. So there's a range of ID I use for me to identify which thread is running which, uh, which of the uh, workload. So that thread number two, number three, all the same. Then I will kickstart, oh, yeah. I'll kickstart the workload one and a duration of five minutes of sleep. And these are the thread, right? Remember I talked about one is pumping one record, and then th this will be ranged. So it sort of tells me which thread is writing what. So that will work number two, number three, and then so on, work, work load number four. Now before that, here is the code that uh, for creating the table, the same stuff at the top, you import all the uh, Python SDK, by the way, this is a separate program, Python program, same thing here. So now the key here is, remember in the uh, previous slide, Mike was saying um, there are two different ways, right? The table limits. Now, if you have a plan to uh, provision a on-demand table, this is what you type in capacity mode equals on-demand. So without this, and, and with the zero, zero for read and write, right? This is the way to set up the on-demand table. Now, without this on-demand capacity mode, then you have three parameters to play with. You have to uh, provision the read, write, and the storage, okay? So I have two scripts which I'm going to run. The first one is, is the um, creating the on-demand table, okay? And the second one will be create the provision table. It's very simple, just call my table, create my table, the, which is the on-demand table here, then wait for 10 seconds or so, then start creating, pumping the data. So let's do that. <clears throat> That's creating the table there. Same thing here. So what I'm gonna do. <coughs> so this initial one is creating table and I insert some record in just to make sure I have the table created and reading the record. And then after that rest for 10 seconds, you start pumping data. So each thread here is showing thread number one, number four, number two, number three. And you can see workload number one, if you look at, if your eye is quick enough, all this part is seconds, right? So every second you have four right operation going into the NoSQL Cloud Service data. Here is the provision, same thing here. Okay, so let me show. So just like any cook showing their recipe and showing their cooking, I actually have something in the oven that I would like to show. And 
we are done with the uh, recipe and how the how to prepare your your stuff. Now here is the uh, workload I run earlier this morning. Let me show that. And again, this is real time and it's slightly different from the, the slide that I show. This is what really happened on the back end. The, the bottom one is pumping data. Oh, by the way, I need to show something before I forget. Um, so the table, two tables that I created is called demo PT, which is provision table. The other one is demo OT, which is the uh, on-demand capacity. As you can see, the read capacity is one here for the PD. Just for the sake of the demo, I, I provision a very low number here. So we can see throttling, for example. I'll be showing that. So for the on-demand table that we created, is the on-demand capacity is there, but you still have to provision your uh, storage there. So the this two table that I'm showing here is actually what I just ran this morning at eight o'clock, right? PT is this one here, OT is the one on the left. So let's look at that. <laughs> so as you can see, the workload, the small workload I mentioned in my slide, the medium-sized workload and the large work, largest workload now is writing the medium size workload, workload number four, which is the, the last workload. And you can see for on the uh, this side, the on-demand table, there's actually nothing here, right? No throttling. And on this side here, you're seeing throttling here, right? When you're writing medium size workload, we are seeing a throttle. By the way, all these dashboards are showing one minute sum. What that means is, as in my slide, within a minute, you'll see close to, for example, close to 480 here. This should be 240. Yeah, close to 240, right? And again, this is like rough simulating, right? Simulations of the workload. So here you're seeing over 900. So that's the largest workload. And again, here on the provision, the throttling happened, right? Let me click again to show if <clears throat> it's more workload coming in. And again, this is the table details and under matrix, you can find all of these uh, dashboards. So yeah, the last workload is showing some uh, throttling again. And again, this is depending on the uh, back out, no SQL backend, how everything works and the throttle pat pattern might be slightly different from cases. Of, for example, this one here is not in my slide, right? This is just what happened on the back end when you stop to ramp up and then ramp down. And then here it, it, it do another, I guess, it, it stops slightly maybe a few milliseconds, then you start to write again, yeah. So the same thing here, this is very smooth, just like what I have in the slide deck, right? Ramping up, then it take a minute or so to ramp down, and then five minutes, a five minutes rest, then ramp up again. So Mike, that's all I have to show. So Mike, pass back to you. So that concludes what, uh, Tim and I had prepared, and so we went through a set of slides, covered the um, some details about the service. We covered the a lot of the different flexibility aspects of our service, flexibility in terms of how you can deploy it, flexibility in terms of the APIs and how you can access the data, uh, flexibility in the different data models, the different provisioning models. So we covered a lot of different uh, aspects of flexibility. And then here, um, we have a always uh, free uh, tier. So you can you know, basically create tables there. There's also a 30-day trial if you wanna use that. Uh, we have uh, LinkedIn discussions. We're always putting out you know, different articles and things like that about the service. 
We also have uh, OCI training that's available on the service. So you can access any one of those. And so I think we have, I don't know, maybe eight or so minutes left. Uh, we can open that up for questions. Um, Ken, I don't know if you want me to stop sharing, I don't know, uh, the process and how we want to exactly handle the questions coming in. Sure. I mean, you can go ahead and keep this up. I've shared the links as well for these um, in chat, and it'll be shared with the replay as well so folks can investigate this. Um, and then we can just open up that Q&A box, it looks like. Um, there's some questions. Um, looks like there's some questions that actually got answered already, which is great. Um, and then we've got somebody wondering, uh, oh yeah, if there's uh, also about resources, if there's some code on GitHub or somewhere else to play with the service, if there's anything that people can use, or that might be covered in the training, I'm not sure. Yes, so to that particular question, um, all of our language drivers are um, hosted in GitHub. Um, each of them has a examples directory. Um, so you can uh, go into there and then you can find um, examples in that particular code. Um, also, our drivers are hosted in what I would call sort of their, their native location. So for instance, our Python driver, um, the development for that is in GitHub. We do our releases out of GitHub but we always will take the most current release and we will upload that to PyPy. Um, for Java and Spring, again, um, we have a GitHub repository for those. Um, so if you want like the most recent one, you'd have to go to GitHub and do your own build. Or um, if you wanna download, those are, are, are located in Maven. Um, Node.js, that's an NPM. So, so yes, we do have that. So any other questions? Take a look. Um, I don't see any popping up yet. It looks like there were some that Tim was answering during your presentation, which is great. Um, and I will have those resources I mentioned um, for the replay and the on-demand um, and also linking back to the forum. So if folks do have questions after the fact, if you watch this later and you're curious about stuff, um, do feel free to post in those forums, ask questions, um, look for answers there as well. So we can continue the conversation after this for sure. Um, and otherwise, if there aren't further questions, I would just like to give a big thank you to Mike and to Tim for coming uh, and sharing this information with us today. Um, and to remind folks that uh, we will have this available for you so you can dig into it at your own time later or share it with folks and uh, see how this can potentially help uh, what you're already doing. So thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us today and uh, seeing what's going on with NoSQL Database. <laughs>